So it's my privilege to be your host and moderator tonight in our series on treaties as sacred covenants. In a few minutes, we're gonna have a land acknowledgement. And as a part of that acknowledgement, I invite you to, to type in into our chat, uh, the lands that you uh, reside on. And then in the land acknowledgement, I'll try to include as many of them as possible. Want to warmly welcome everyone here to this uh, conversation. We especially welcome Janice Montour, who's speaking uh, to us tonight on the Indigenous perspective of Indigenous settler relations. I'll have a fuller introduction of Janice later on. Janice, it's great to have you with us today. We are recording this event. So if you don't want to be seen, uh, then all you have to do is go down to the uh, right-hand corner or bottom left corner of your screen and right about there, uh, you should have a little camera that if you press on it once, you'll have a red line go through it, and then we will not be able to see you, and uh, you won't be seen in the recording. Uh, let's do our land acknowledgement. This land acknowledgement was adopted by the Niagara Truth and Reconciliation Working Group in 2019, and has been adopted by a number of the churches here in the Niagara area where I live and work. We acknowledge that the land on which we live and work and worship and prosper is a traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Adirondack people. Others of us live on Treaty One lands. We live in the lands of the Wendat Huron uh, and of the neutral people. This treaty is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protect, protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Our ancestors, my ancestors, came to this land seeking to escape the oppression and economic deprivation and found in Canada a place to thrive and to prosper in peace and security. And yet we've come to realize that we have prospered by the policies and practices that have marginalized and devastated those who first inhabited this place. As followers of Jesus Christ, the love of Christ urges us on to pursue justice for our indigenous neighbors and friends. Second Corinthians five says that in Christ Jesus, God has reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation. And there really cannot be any greater need or work for reconciliation than with those who first inhabited these lands. With this acknowledgement, we commit ourselves to working for justice for the indigenous peoples of these lands, moving towards a manner that, forward in a manner that fosters respect, dignity, and equality. And right now, I also want to especially commemorate and remember the Mi'kmaq people in Nova Scotia who are advocating for their rights, seeking to provide for their own families, not simply asserting their rights, but much more asserting the well being of their community and their people and their families. And my heart goes out to them. I know all of our hearts and prayers go out to them. We are a diverse group of people participating in tonight's conversation. We, we live across this country. Many of us are followers of Christ, but not all. Most of us are Mennonites, but not all. Some of us are from families that have been Mennonites for generations, but definitely not all of us. That flavors how we enter this conversation and what we take away from it. As followers of Christ, we're very familiar with the idea of covenant. In the Old Testament, God made covenants with his people on a number of different occasions. And of course, as we know from the stories that many of us grew up on, his people broke those covenants. It's helpful for us to think and consider that we live on lands where covenant treaties have been made with indigenous people only to be broken. What does that mean for you and I? as we learn this greater story and history of treaty making and covenant breaking in Canada. 
Over the seven events of this series, Treaties as Sacred Covenants, we're looking at our shared history of covenants made and broken with Indigenous people and what it means for us to move forward to do the reconciling work of keeping the covenants that we have made. We want to thank Mennonite Church Eastern Canada for hosting and facilitating these conversations. Uh, for Lisa Williams, who's done an awful lot to, on the technical side of things. And today, Molly Mulau is working with us, uh, helping to make this run smoothly. If you have any questions for Molly, uh, you can contact her through our Zoom feature, uh, through our chat feature. Our chat moderator today is Scott Morton Ninomia. We're going to have a, a question time uh, towards the uh, later on. If you have any comments or questions for Janice, uh, please use our chat feature. And Scott will uh, have a look through the questions and pass them on to Janice. Scott is the chair of the MCEC Truth and Reconciliation Working Group, and an all around great guy and a very hard worker. He has done most of the heavy lifting or a lot of the heavy lifting. Listing, lifting. He's not gonna say most, I'm gonna say he's done most of it. Uh, to bring this all together. Thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, using the, the chat feature to ask your questions allows us to bundle together similar questions and allows us to get in as many questions as possible. Right now, I want to invite Mim Harder to open in prayer. Mim grew up in the Markham area with both settler and Indigenous roots, and she strives to walk the path given to her by Creator to braid understanding and build bridges between nations that live on this land today. Mim works with Kairos Blanket Exercise, the MCC Indigenous Neighbors, and Willow Grove as a grandmother. She lead, she's a lead facilitator trainer uh, for the Kairos Blanket Exercise here in groups for groups in Ontario and in the US. Mim has been given the name of Wingashke Ikwe, which means sweet grass woman. Ma'am, please lead us in prayer. Now I make what um, every morning when I get up and I started doing this soon after the lockdown started, um, I recite the Thanksgiving address to myself. Um, and there's a reason I do that. It's a reminder that we don't walk alone the earth does not need us, we need the earth. And despite these different times that we're in, there is still so much to be thankful for. It's a reminder to be respectful of what goes on around us and to not be fearful. It is a reminder to walk with a heart of gratitude. And so tonight I will recite a version of the Thanksgiving address. These are the words that come before all else. Today we have gathered and we see the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty and the responsibility to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one as we give our greetings and our thanks to one another as people. We are all thankful for our mother of the earth. She who gives us all that we need for life gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send our greetings and our thanks. We give thanks to the waters of the world in their many forms. Water is life. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to the spirit of the water. We turn our minds to all the fish life they were instructed to cleanse and purify the water and to give themselves as food. We now turn to the fish and we send our greetings and our thanks. We turn toward the plants. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working many wonders. They sustain many forms of life. With our minds gathered together, we give our thanks and look forward to seeing the plant life continue for many generations to come. With one mind, we turn and honor the food plants, those that we harvest from the garden to help us survive. We gather all the food plants together as one and we send them our greetings and our thanks. We turn to the medicine plants of the world. 
From the beginning, they were instructed to take away sickness. We are happy that they are still among us with those special few who remember how to use those plants for healing. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to the medicines and to the keeper of those medicines. We gather our minds together to send our greetings and thanks to all the animal life in the world. They have many things to teach us as people. We are honored by them and that they give up their lives to feed the people. We are glad that they are still here and we pray that they always will be so. We turn our thoughts to the trees. They provide us with shelter, shade, fruit, with beauty and other useful things. Long ago, our people were given a way of peace and strength, and this way is symbolized with the everlasting tree of peace. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to the tree life. We put our minds together as one and we thank all the bird life. Creator gave them a beautiful song and some of them provide us with food. Each day they remind us to enjoy and appreciate life. To all the birds, from the smallest to the largest, we send our joyful greetings and our thanks. We are thankful for the power of the four winds. We hear their voices in the moving air as they refresh us and purify the air we breathe. They help to bring the changes of the season. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to the four winds. We turn to the west where our grandfathers, the thunderers, live. With lightning and thundering voices, they bring with them the water that renews life. We bring our minds together as one to send our greetings and our thanks to our grandfathers, the thunderers. We now send our greetings and thanks to our eldest brother, the sun. Each day without fail, he travels the sky from east to west, bringing the light of a new day. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to our brother, the sun. We put our minds together to give thanks to our oldest grandmother, the moon, who lights the nighttime sky. She is the leader of all women all over the world and she governs the move, movement of the ocean tides. By her changing face, we measure time. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to our grandfather, the moon. We give our greetings and our thanks to the stars who spread across the sky like jewels. They help the moon to light the darkness and bring dew to the gardens and the growing things. With our minds gathered together as one, we send our greetings and our thanks to those sparkly stars. We gather our minds together to consider the wisdom keepers who have come to help the people throughout the ages. When we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way we were instructed to live. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to these caring teachers. We now turn our thoughts to Creator and send our greetings and our thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this earth, Mother Earth. For all the love that is around us, we gather our minds together as one and we send our choicest words of greetings and our thanks to our Creator. We have now arrived at the place where we end our words. For that which is forgotten, we remember. Now our minds are one. All my relations. Amen. Thank you, Mim. <clears throat> if there's anything in this talk that uh, troubles us at all, and you'd like to talk with someone, Mim has made herself available, and you can contact her in the chat feature, uh, or I think, or you can contact her more directly. Molly, are you able to put that number up now? Yep, it's in the chat bar. It's in the chat feature. Excellent. Thank you. As Mennonite settlers, and in fact, as settler people in general, we need to learn the greater story and the history of treaty making in Canada. Some of these treaties, such as the Haldeman Treaty that Janice will be discussing with us, are well over 200 years old, and they've disappeared from our settler cultural memory a long time ago reemerging only now recently. 
I grew up in, in Vancouver, British Columbia. And of course, I heard about the indigenous people of that place. And I remember wondering to myself, where were they all? Where were all the indigenous people that used to inhabit that land? It's only been in the last several years that I've discovered the fuller history and story of our indigenous people. And it's broken my heart, what I've read and what I've heard and what I've engaged. We need to make the current reality here in Canada right. Janice is going to speak to us on the history of the Haldeman Treaty of 1784, specifically as it relates to those ter territories that Mennonites, many Mennonites live and worship on. Now, many of us are not from the Haldeman Tract. But even so, we have much to learn here and take away here because we all live and worship on Indigenous lands and our houses of worship are on Indigenous lands. Janice Montour is from six nations of the Grand River Mohawk Nation Turtle Clan. Janice has recently re returned this past May as the Executive Director of the Woodland Cultural Centre. Previ previously, she was the Executive Director there from 2003 until 2017. Before returning to her current role, Janice was appointed the Director of Tourism and Cultural Initiatives for the Six Nations Development Corporation. She was also a committee member for the Great Lakes Research Alliance for the study of Aboriginal arts and culture and for the Arts and Culture Advisory Council for the Toronto 2015 Pan Am, Para Pan Am, uh, games. Janice, we look forward to, to hearing what you have to say to us this evening. Blessings to you as you speak to us. Noah, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, so as I start in my culture, we introduce ourselves in our language. Uh, uh, my name is Gohondokta. Uh, it's my Mohawk name. I am Mohawk from and Turtle Clan from Six Nations. I'm very happy to be here with you all today. And uh, what I'm presenting is something I actually takes me a couple hours to really go through and do a deep dive. Uh, tonight we're going to give you an overview and really just sort of speak to um, the Haldeman Treaty, what is land claims, and where do we go from here. So I'm going to share my screen with everyone so you can see it. So the Haldeman Treaty 1784 to today, understanding the complexities uh, Six Nations of the Grand River. So for those of you who may not know, how did the Haldeman Treaty come to be? Well, my people, the Haudenosaunee, uh, were originally from the Five Finger Lake region in Upper New York State. And um, after the American Revolution, um, those who were allies of Joseph Brandt, so the Mohawks and some other nations, uh, became allies of the British. And at that time, they, uh, obviously we, the war was won by the Americans and they weren't happy uh, with us being allies. So they started to uh, burn our cornfields, uh, burn down our corn storage to get us out, pretty much starve us from the United States. So Joseph Brandt went to his uh, friend um, at the time, uh, Sir Frederick Haldeman, and said, listen, you know, we fought for your people during the American Revolution. What can you do to help us? The Americans don't want us living in our traditional homelands anymore. So we were granted this treaty in October, 1784, which pretty much runs six miles on either side of the Grand River uh, from its mouth to its source. And this tract of land was to be in our uh, possession and to be enjoyed forever. Well, we know that did not happen. So what does the Haldeman Treaty look like today? 
So this was the approximately 950,000 acres that were granted to our people in 1784. It's outlined there along the river. And this is the geographic, uh, but also the measurements that were given to us as per the, the agreement. Today, we hold less than 5% of the original uh, land. And this is it's at 46,500 acres. And it's the little red spot um, in that map. It looks a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle piece. Um, that is where my community is today. Um, and that's what our current land base is here at Six Nations of the Grand River. So for many of you, um, the tract of land is actually broken down into several parts um, that were called blocks. So one to four is sort of north, uh, almost just past Fergus is, would be uh, block four. And then you would slowly go down to three, two, and one. Block two is actually in the Waterloo region. Uh, block five and six are more towards the southern tip of the treaty properties. So, in 1796, Joseph Brandt was given the power of attorney to surrender interests to the Crown, uh, blocks one, two, three, and four, to secure 999 yearly payments for Six Nations perpetual care and maintenance. In 1798, Joseph Brandt exceeds his power of attorney and surrenders blocks one to six in trust to the Crown. So in particular, when we look at block two, which is Waterloo Township, it's approximately 94,000 acres. So a lot more than what we have now here at Six Nations. Um, this Brant power of attorney comes into place, as we said, in 1796. And in 1798, these letters patent were issued to Richard Beasley, James Wilson, and John B. Rousseau. Later, the joint mortgage was executed. In 1802, Six Nations were induced to release Beasley and Association from mortgage, and the block was to be subdivided and separate mortgages executed. All the required principal and interest paid by the purchasers of Block 2 was not credited to our Six Nations trust accounts, and no discharge of mortgages can be located. And also, the proceeds from this Block 2 went on to shape what is now Canada. This was actually a public notice that was given um, by Samuel P. Jarvis, who was an uh, Indian Affairs agent at the time. And he went on to acknowledge that there were a number of uh, persons who intruded themselves upon the lands on the south side of the Grand River, primarily between the townships of Brantford and Dunn, and exclusively appropriated to the use of the Six Nations Indians. So this public notice was notified, you can see the date there, um, but was largely ignored by those who were now appropriating the lands that were once ours. So people often ask, if we go, you know, you look at the treaty, it seems sort of straightforward, but what has happened from really the late 1780s to today here at Six Nations? So what I like to sort of start off is, well, people always often ask, well, what is a land claim and what does it really mean? So Six Nations Land Claim Office started in 1974, around the same time as the creation of the Office of Native Claims. This is a federal department. So Six Nations Lands and Research investigates breaches of the Crown's fiduciary obligation to manage Six Nations lands and resources in the best interests of the people of Six Nations. In the development of land claims, there are four main areas of investigation. And these are, one, were the terms of the October 25th, 1784 Haldeman Treaty and other treaties fulfilled and honored? Two, were the alienations of portions of the Six Nations Tract undertaken lawfully? Three, were the terms and conditions of the alienation fulfilled? And four, were the financial assets derived from the land alienations properly accounted for and maximize to the benefit of the Six Nations of Grand River Indians. So I'm gonna give you, you can see on the screen, I'm not gonna read all of this, but this is just to give you a concept of how much money was being taken without our knowledge out of our trust funds that was being held by, um, we actually put it in the same bank as the King and Queen of England. Um, and, in England. So our trust fund was being held in England 
And this is sort of where it shows you how the Indian agents were accessing our trust fund without our knowledge, and then in turn building what would become Canada. So when you look at the land claim, so why should we put in a land claim? There is a process that you then have to undertake with the Crown slash Canada. So Canada specific claims policy was created in 1982 to address the many illegal acts and injustices attributed to the Crown in right of Canada and its agents. This specific claims policy was then amended in 1991. And at that time, there had only been 370 claims settled since 1973. That's, and those aren't including Six Nations. A specific claims tribunal act came into effect in 2008. There are four scenarios in which a First Nation can file a claim with the tribunal if they choose to. These scenarios are as follows. If a claim has not been accepted for negotiation by Canada, if Canada fails to meet the three-year time frame set out in legislation for assessing claims, if at any stage the negotiation process, if all parties agree, and if three years of negotiations do not result in a final settlement. Also keep in mind there's a limit on the award of compensation of $150 million per individual claim. It cannot be awarded punitive damages, compensation for cultural or spiritual losses or non-financial compensation. Six Nations would also have to withdraw all claim submissions prior to 2008 and resubmit them with new evidence or allegations to be considered for the tribunal. So under the terms of the Indian Act between 1927 and 1951, First Nations in Canada were not able to hire lawyers to bring claims against the Crown without the government's permission. Those provisions of the Indian Act were repealed and First Nations were then able to pursue their grievances against the government. If an outstanding lawful obligation is found and damages are owed, Crown Canada offers to negotiate a settlement with First Nations. So under the prior system, the government was the sole judge on the amount and type of award. Under the new system, superior court judges decide on validity of claim and how much will be awarded. The awards have a limit and because of this limit, they are not deemed appropriate to our claims here at Six Nations. And as of 1995, the Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada Department has not, has refused to accept any claims from Six Nations through the specific claims policy. So I talked about 1995. This was a really important year at Six Nations. Um, we submitted a court case that was launched um, against Ontario and Canada for an accounting of how Six Nations were disposed of and what has become of the proceeds which ought to have been held in trust and invested for the benefit of the Six Nations since October 25th, 1784. This uh, court case has been ongoing since 1995. Um, there was headway made here and there, but it evidently just kept getting stalled and stalled and our community um, continue to incur large legal bills um, to keep pursuing this particular case, but it's still within the courts. And then in 2008, um, the duty to consult and accommodate was developed. So this was in 2008, the court case was against the city of Brantford and the province on Ontario on the duty to consult and accommodate Six Nations prior to all development within the city limits of Brantford. There's a lot of uh, specific plots of land within the city boundaries that are considered um, not decided. They, were, they weren't uh, legally part of the town plot, which was set aside. Um, and also there's a several pieces around the Nathan Gage lands, which are still under, um, as well as um, currently where the city of Bradford Casino uh, sits. Um, that is also a parcel of land that is currently uh, on Icon Drive, which is also under uh, land claim. So, what can be done? What are the res resolutions to injustices? 
So there was a document that was put forth by the Six Nations Lands and Resources Department. It was called Global Solutions. And it was developed as a way to try to, you know, understand the crowns and justices that were done to the Six Nations um, as going against what the Haldeman Treaty stood for and then also the misuse of the trust fund account. And in this Global Solutions, it was trying to figure out how do we best move forward in our current climate? How do we work with the government systems? How do we work with the court systems? And this is trying to work with not only the federal government, but also the provincial government, because there's also separate um, legislations for both that impact um, a number of the claims that have been submitted. So these are just, I'm gonna give you some examples of some that we have put forward from our community um, to the municipalities, to the province and to the federal government. So these are examples of creative solutions in which Six Nations is compensated, negotiated for these injustices and by other means, rather than litigation and land claim submissions. So we're trying to see how do we get through this without having to go through the courts necessarily because it takes up a lot of money and a lot of time. And then also how do we get this so we're not always at a stalemate. So these are some of the examples. Land return. So the municipality of the city of Brantford, the Grand River Conservation Authority and the province of Ontario determined the need for flood protection work to be undertaken in the city of Brantford. Part of the proposal was the construction of a protective dike in the vicinity of the Mohawk Chapel. The Mohawk Chapel sits on actual uh, Six Nations land within the city limits. The negotiations commenced in 1981 with the GRCA and Six Nations. And in 1983, Six Nations tabled 13 points that would have to be met for a formal agreement to proceed. In May of that year, in order for the issuance of a permit by the Minister of Indian Affairs, Six Nations and the Grand River Conservation Authority signed a memorandum of understanding. This MOU identified protective dike that would cross Six Nations lands. The Mohawk Chapel would be protected. Major improvements around the Mohawk Chapel grounds would be done by the GRCA. Maintenance of the expanded chapel grounds and parking areas would be maintained for five years by the GRCA with a maintenance review to follow and lots 13 and 14 Eagles Nest Tract would be added to the Six Nations land base. On September 17, 1987, by order in council, lots 13 and 14 Eagles Nest Tract containing 56.5 acres was set aside for the use and benefit of the Six Nations Indians. Another point to consider in creative solution, compensation. In December 1984, Six Nations Council reached a tentative agreement with the federal government for the unauthorized transfer of land now being used by the Canadian National Railway, running along the eastern limit of the reserve comprising of 80.616 acres. This arose from the Six Nations claim to the Canadian National Railway right of way in Oneida Township. Consequently, it became necessary to arrive at a monetary value of the claim. After prolonged negotiations, an amount of $610,000 was agreed upon. However, rather than take cash settlement, the Six Nations Band Council took options on three parcels of land. A survey of the lands were undertaken and the Six Nations Band Council therefore called for a surrender of vote under six, section 39 of the Indian Act. Of the band's interest in the railway lands consisting of 80.616 acres upon the condition of having the 259 acres added to the Six Nations Reserve. Two referendums were held in November and December of 1985, and then subsequently by order in council, in 1987, the 259 acres were added to Six Nations Indian Reserve number 40. The third creative solution, interim use agreements. Six Nations has had outstanding financial land issues filed with the Crown since 1982, with little hope of achieving settlements satisfactory to Six Nations in light of the inadequacies of Canada's specific claims policy. Furthermore, any litigation Six Nations may be involved in would take several years to reach a final satisfactory settlement. In view of these times, Six Nations worked jointly with surrounding municipalities, corporations and governments to allow persons to occupy the lands in a responsible manner and permit development to proceed under certain terms and covenants and without prejudice to our position on claims. So I'll give you an example of two. 
In 1981, an interim agreement was reached that allowed the Ontario Ministry of Transportation to build the Caledonia Bypass Bridge across the Grand River. As payment or compensation for this permission, the Ministry of Transportation built Six Nations a much needed Chiefswood Bridge that would cross the Grand River within the boundaries of Six Nations. In 1993, the Corporation of the town of Dunville entered into an interim agreement with Six Nations to cross approximately 876 feet for a sewer right of way across land that is subject to a specific claim remaining unresolved. Continued use of these 876 feet would then be subject to a new lease arrangement between Six Nations and the town of Dunville. The fourth creative solution, land purchases. So where lands have been unlawfully alienated to third parties, the option of having lands return as part of the compensation must be made available. To assist the process, Six Nations has and should continue to purchase lands to add to the Six Nations land base. When settlements are negotiated for these purchase areas, Six Nations will be reimbursed for these lands. These land acquisition costs as are conditions to future settlements by a trust agreement. These lands are held in trust by three Six Nations lawyers for the use and benefit of Six Nations. An example, in 1991, Six Nations and the Ministry of Transportation entered into an interim agreement to allow repairs to a provincial road, but on land wherein a specific claim remains unresolved. Ontario paid the, to use the 15 acres at issue until the claim is resolved. A new agreement would be required for continued use of these 15 acres if the claim is decided in favor of Six Nations. The monies from this agreement were used to purchase two separate parcels of land adjacent to the river, one parcel in Oneida Township and another in Onondaga Township, and it is added to Reserve Number 40. And the fifth creative solution, additions to reserve process. In addition to reserve is a parcel of land that is added to the existing land base of a First Nation or is used to create a new reserve. The legal title to the land is set apart for the use and benefit of the First Nation making the application. Land can be added to the reserve in rural or urban settings. The additions to the reserve process was created by the federal government in, 70, in 1972. And this policy sets out the conditions and issues to be addressed before land can become reserve and attempts to balance the interests of all levels of government. The policy was created to fill legislative gap as ATRs are not addressed in the Indian Act or other federal legislation. And there have been several uh, acres added to the reserve. Currently, we are at just over 1,000 acres that have now been added to reserve. These are just some of the comments that came out of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. It talks about that there can be no peace or harmony unless there is justice. And this is sort of how it's reflected today. As many of you know, OCA in 1990, there was a position paper that was written a few years back by Lands and Research. And, we, and I'm gonna read part of it, just so we can sort of have an idea of what, what this meant and how things got to this escalation that happened in OCA, Ipperwash, and Caledonia. Canada's failure to address and resolve legitimate claims of First Nations. So something my father always says to me, uh, my father actually, sorry, I should have maybe preempted this. My father spent 27 years doing research for land claims at Six Nations. He was the main land claims researcher. He used to give this example many times and I think it's probably the most reflective to help you understand. What would you say if your neighbor came over into your property say six feet and expanded his fence line and says to you, oh, this is mine now. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep it here. And you say, um, no, sorry. One, you didn't ask permission to move your fence over six feet. And two, when, at, whenever did you even consult me and how can you think that this is yours now just because you moved your fence over? But then he tells you, well, if you have a complaint, take it up with someone. So you do, you go to the proper authorities and you file a complaint that your neighbor moved his fence over by six feet. Turns out that those authorities work for him. 
what would you do? Then he tells you, well, sue me. Then you can see if this fence will get moved. Well, then he tells you, however, though, you can't actually hire a lawyer and they can't work for you because they all work for me. And then you say to him, well, that's not fair. You need to, you can't just have every lawyer work for you. He goes, okay, well, there's a lawyer in another town next to us. You can hire him. He doesn't work for me. So you go to that lawyer, but he charged you five times the amount that you would have paid for a lawyer in your own community. So finally he says, okay, I'm willing to discuss it, but first you have to prove I did something wrong. Oh, and I get to be the judge of whether you've proved it. And if you do prove it, I get to set the rules about how we'll negotiate. I'll decide when we've reached a deal and I'll even get to determine how I'll pay the settlement out to you. Oh, and I hope you're in no rush because this is going to take about 20 or 30 years to settle. Sounds crazy, right? Well, welcome to the world of Indian specific claims. These specific claims arose when Canada and its agents failed to live up to Canada's responsibilities in connection with First Nations lands, monies, and assets. In some cases, Canada didn't give them the land they were promised in the treaties. In some cases, they got the land only to have it taken away again in a way that violated Canada's own rules. And in other cases, federal employees actually stole Indian land, money, or other assets. Fast forward. So despite all the hurdles I told you about, there were still the 370 claims that were settled. It has not meant an immediate improvement to the lives of First Nations in this country. It hasn't exactly strengthened relations in, between Canada and First Nations either. There's currently a backlog of close to a thousand claims in the Specific Claims Commission. And things are getting worse rather than better. And First Nations have been patient, incredibly patient, but their patience is wearing thin. And that they're and to make you guys understand that the choice is clear, that justice, respect, and honor is all that we're asking. And unfortunately, that's when Oka, Ipperwash happened in 1995, and Caledonia in 2006, and then again this current year. Canada is a great nation. It's a great nation on the world stage. But Canada will only achieve great true greatness when it has fulfilled its legal obligations to First Nations. And that is the biggest piece that when people ask, well, how come you don't settle? How come it takes so long? How come there's road blockades? This isn't something that's been happening in the last 20 years. This is something that's been going on for hundreds of years. It's also something that wasn't even considered until 1974. And knowing firsthand and seeing the struggles that my father has gone through for 30 plus years, it's tiring, it's frustrating. And the young people who are very well educated in our communities, who know their history, who know the language, who know the culture, who understand policy, understand bureaucracy, are tired. And this is why we're seeing these frustrations come to a place. We don't want this to happen, but we want them to, at least we want Canada and the province to come to the table and settle with this. An interesting thing happened in 2012. Six Nations and City of Brantford and the County of Brant and the MPP and MP for Brant County, we're at an impasse. They had been an impasse for several months, several years about the duty to consult and accommodate, but also around some of these specific claims that, you know, the city was very well aware of, the county was very well aware of. It took them 13 months to sit down with members of Aboriginal Affairs in Northern Development Canada to sit them down with members from the Ministry of Transportation to look at these claims. 13 months it took them to get this meeting and they all fly out there, members from Six Nations, City of Brantford, 
the Brant County, like the mayors and MP and MPP, all these people took the time, got out there to meet with them, had a meeting with them and nothing was ever resolved. So it's not like there's not an urgent, it's not like that there's not people willing to try to work. The problem has been for many years is that no one's coming to the table to deal with these claims. And yet development continues to encroach onto those claims that have already been submitted and are unresolved. That's what you see in Caledonia. That's what you see in Olka. It's what you saw in Ipperwash. This, this wasn't something that just happened. It's been something that's been happening for hundreds of years. And as I showed you in the slide, there's also a huge issue around the trust monies that Canada and its Indian agents were taking from our trust fund account while our people were starving at that time. So what I want you at the end of the day to, to take note of is how do, we, how do we impact change? Ask your governments to sit down at the table, ask them to consult and accommodate, ask them to understand and educate themselves about what it is about treaty rights, but also what it is to work with the First Nation and that treaty land that, you know, is currently not with our people. Ona, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Janice. <clears throat> that's, um, yeah, that's educating, enlightening. It, it's heart wrenching, uh, thought provoking. But uh, more than any of that, it, it just brings that sick feeling in my gut and my throat again. Just a, a question that I, a comment I have so often is how, how is it possible that, that a country that has been so good to me and my family can be like this? You, you mentioned the, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. And they, I've, I've been reading some of that lately. And it had in 1996 asked that a 20 year process you begun in, in, in 1996, that within six months of that report being handed into parliament, that a 20 year process should begin of renewal in the relationship between Aboriginal and Canadian people. And they do some math in there, right? And, and they measured it out, what that would cost. And one of the things that has so, been so striking to me is, is as horrific as our treatment of Aboriginal people has been, and certainly the Aboriginal people, the Indigenous peoples have borne the brunt of it. There's no getting around that, but it has cost Canadians too. And it just really makes me think that like oppressing people is expensive. Uh, and, and the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People does a, spells out, you know, how much it costs the federal government uh, to run the ministry and to, to have the relationship that we have with them. Whereas if Indigenous people were given a proper land base and were given economic development, and if Canadians were taught this history so that we knew about the treaties that we'd made, that Canada as a nation would benefit. Uh, I, I've often thought about it. I, I read uh, several years ago, um, the book, uh, Clearing the Plains. And it talked about how the Cree people in the 1870s were asking the Canadian government for enough land so that they could learn to farm so that they could be self-sufficient. And instead of allowing the Indigenous people in the prairies in the 1870s to be self-sufficient and thereby be independent, we marginalized the Indigenous people and then we had to shell out money in order to keep them marginalized. How does that make, why did that make sense to us then and why does it make sense to us now? Um, so thank you, Janice. And yeah, we, we, have, to, we have to make this right. Um, 
Scott, we're going to hand it over to you. And uh, oh no, first we're going to do the uh, the the mug and the honorarium. So Janice has received a, a mug from us. This is a uh, a gift, a small gift that we've given her and uh, to the Woodland Cultural Center uh, has received an honorarium on uh, as a thank you uh, for Janice's presentation tonight. Thank you so much. So what was that? Have you had a sip out of that mug yet? What was the first thing you drank out of there? No, not yet, because it just arrived in the mail yesterday. Wow. <laughs> so I just brought it into my office space. Excellent. All right. It'll be tea. It'll be tea, all right. Yeah. I was guessing tea. I don't know why, but I didn't think you were a coffee drinker. So I am not. Okay. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> so Scott, do you do we have any questions yet for uh, for Janice? Yes, we sure do. Yeah, I'll um, I can start reading. Some of them are are in um, they fit together. So I'm just putting the last few. A couple have just come in recently. Wow, okay, there's another one that just came in, but I'm gonna start some of these and then keep an eye on the chat. So um, just before I jump into the questions, people have said lots of things in the chat. People said, thank you, amen, truth, so powerful and disturbing. Thank people were appreciative of the, of the detail that they hadn't heard before and also said they could hear the pain, fatigue and sadness in your voice. So, so yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, feedback coming from the chat. In terms of questions, there were a number of those um, and I saw that a couple of people put up some information. Um, Marlene Epp put some information there about specific about uh, sixnations.ca land resources uh, forward slash claim summaries. So I'll uh, we'll make sure that that um, uh, that link gets sent to everyone. But a couple of people asked. Ron Fleming asked with regard to trust fund for Six Nations that you spoke about early on. Where did the money come from? and that was in that trust fund then lent out to many non six nation uses and then um, a question that i had in relation to that was um has there been an effort to demand that that unaccounted for money be paid back to six nations and if so could settlers be involved in that sort of demand and talk to the people who we elected <laughs> so those are the first two questions about the trust fund money yeah so the proceeds um from the trust fund and what makes up that trust fund amount is uh, the 999 year leases I spoke to briefly um, regarding the blocks one to six. So there were several that were um, sold out, right? So some of, some of those lands were uh, properly sold. Others were put in a lot, a lot of times the Confederacy chiefs at the time. So we have to, also have to clarify this. So there's two, there's two types of government within Six Nations of Grand River. There is the traditional Confederacy Council at Grand River, uh, which would have been the council that the government Indian agents would have been dealing with at that time in the 1700s and 1800s. Um, in 1924, the Six Nations Confederacy Council was ousted uh, and removed and an elected council came into play, uh, very similar to a municipal city council. Uh, so the elected council is currently the only government uh, system that is recognized by the federal government. Uh, so the Confederacy chiefs at the time had set up and had agreed to um, these 999 year leases. So all those lease funds were being put into this trust account. Um, the Queen's Bank actually is where it went um, because we wanted to make sure that it was safe and that uh, if and when we needed it, the trust fund money would be there. Um, so we were getting regular accountings of the trust funds um, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and then things went very awry um, shortly thereafter, and the trust fund statements were getting less and less, and we weren't sort of seeing where the, the accounting and the, and the balance wasn't making sense. Um, so a lot of that's where a lot of the trust funds uh, money derives from, are those lease, those lease agreements, and there was a lot of them, um, if you look at the blocks one to six. Um, how do we account for the loss of trust monies? 
So in the global solutions, which you can also find on sixnations.ca, a lot of the information I said to you today is from notes. My father wrote a lot of what is in global solutions. So I have a lot of his notes because um, I'm not as much of an expert as this as my father is. I would love to have had him join me, um, but he was busy <laughs> tonight. Um, so when they did a proper accounting, if you took into the rate of inflation, um, it would bankrupt Canada, what is owed to the trust um, and what was taken. Um, so that's the major issue. Um, I think one of the things uh, looking forward and how we try to get around it was when I gave you those creative solutions. So some of the things, what can you do? What can, you know, so looking at partnerships is really, really key. And we have several partnerships that were established um, in recent years um, regarding um, economic development or uh, renewable energy projects in the Haldeman track. So we have partnerships with Samsung where we're a shareholder in wind farms. Uh, we're also uh, a shareholder in, you know, uh, Brent Renewable Energy in the county um, and some several other uh, wind farms in Niagara and Haldem and Norfolk. So it is a way to share those resources that are and the funds that are being made and generated in our in our traditional territory. I don't know if that exactly answered your question, but that uh, yeah, that definitely. I mean, that, that's there's probably a very long answer to that question, but there was some really <laughs> great information there. So um, yeah, and we've got places to go for more information as well. Um, I want to get through some more of these questions yeah. because there are some really interesting ones here that I'm sure you could speak a lot about them as well. But um, a couple other ones are um, uh, one person, a, a, a simple one from Barb Ortelli was she loved the fence analogy and was wondering if that's available in print. It is. So if oh, you thanks. go to, um, hold on, I have several papers that my father gives me. So. If you actually read it, um, you can find it. Um, it was an excerpt from the final report of the Standing Senate Committee on Aboriginal Peoples in 2006. Standing Senate Committee report. On Aboriginal on Peoples. Yep. And it was a special study on the federal specific claims process. Okay. In 2006, yeah. Yeah, okay. I've, I've taken some note of that. If somebody else got the full notes, I'd love to get those um, of the full title. Um, Ruth Meyer asked a big question and a more specific question. Um, she asked, what is the best thing to do to change these atrocities? And then more specifically, who specifically can we write to about the issues that you raised, um, especially around um, you know, restitution for the money that is the money and land that's just gone missing or unaccounted for. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we we try to do here at Six Nations and work that my father has done for, you know, the past three decades is education. So he has spoken many times, various universities, he's spoken to municipalities, um, and to bring them that that awareness. So I would say the biggest key is, is spreading the word. What, like, what, what is the Haldeman Treaty? What does it mean? What is you know, what does the land claim mean in our region or how does it impact us? Um, so really the big thing is, is education because a lot of people don't understand. And like, so when they see things like the blockades going up and I mean, I hear this a lot. I mean, I live at Six Nations. I live right beside Caledonia. The town's like literally seven minutes down the road from my house. They'll, they'll make comments to me, like in a store, for example, like I'll just be going about my business, trying to shop and they'll be like making comments. Like, well, I don't know why they feel like they have to shut down and keep our town hostage. Why do they got to put blockades up? Like how we didn't do this. And my, my first thing is like, okay, but what if we did the exact opposite to you? Like we're, we're making you feel inconvenienced because we've been feeling like this for like 200 years. And it's not anything remotely to what we feel every day and what we have to deal with every day. But at the end of the day, the reason those blockades are up are, is frustration. It's out of, you know, the lack of people coming to the table. 
So sometimes I say to people, well, write to the mayor or the city council or the county council that you that you live in. Ask them, like, have you, do you know about the Haldeman Treaty? If not, like, let's learn about it. Two, I think every community has new developments all the time that occur in the community, whether it's, you know, economic development based or whether it's residential developments. Ask your municipality or your county and say, hey, quick question, is this been consulted with the traditional territory of the people that this belongs to? So asking those questions of your government officials, go to your MPP, go to your MP, ask them questions, say, listen, like, why isn't this being dealt with? And a lot of times people do get very frustrated. And what you see at the at the front lines is not government officials trying to negotiate. You see the OPP, the police services, you know, the Quebec police and OCA. You see them having to take up the front lines for the government because they're not willing to deal with the issue at hand. And I think a lot of this could be prevented if, you know, the government would come to the table and start to resolve these uh, outstanding and unresolved land claims. Yeah, yeah, that's so before we ever get to what we see in Caledonia or in Nova Scotia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I don't want to forget Beth Metzger's question, where can I find more details about how tracks were sold off, especially those involving Beasley, which I think we heard before we started about his nickname of Weasley Beasley. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So he was, I think he had a little bit of uh, fingers in the trust fund pot. Um, so where you can find out about it, again, check out sixnations.ca, go to the lands and resources uh, page. There's a huge breakdown. My father has done a lot of work around um, specific blocks, block two being one of them. Um, but if you do require more information or you can't find it or really accessible, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I can also um, send that along as well. Yeah, and Mim made a shout out to Woodland Cultural Center. The, the yeah. good people at Woodland Cultural Center. Um, okay, I'm going to keep rolling with these questions because there's a few more and they're they're all good ones. So um, Scott Albrecht says, are there specific ways that the governments can make good face actions, not just more words, quickly, something like a development moratorium on uh, disputed land or initial payments, as well as finding an outside arbitrator to run the land claims process? Um, and then another question that he asked was, is there a trust fund in existence today to which settlers could contribute as a form of reparations? So that's, I ran a lot of things by you, but <laughs> yeah, okay. I can, um, I can go over it again if you need. <laughs> so um, moratorium on development um, is tricky because there's also, uh, it's not necessarily a federal thing. And that's our, our issue more, more, more or less takes, the treaty was between us and the Crown, mm. right? originally before Canada came into to be. Then of course, once Canada was developed, then it became uh, uh, first, you know, our people and, and Canada and the treaties sort of went and sometimes they got out of it because they were like, oh, it was with the crowd, it wasn't with Canada, but ours continues and we still to this day will say Canada, which is the federal government. Um, however, development and permits and all that stuff sometimes comes from the province. So that's where it gets a little tricky and that's where, they will internally fight with one another. They'll be like, okay, well, this is now a, a provincial issue, not a federal. And the province is like, um, no, that's, uh, you know, currently under Indian Act. And therefore that's a federal issue. And that, and that piece of land is considered un, you know, unaccounted land claim, then that's a federal issue. But then the province is the one who issues the permits for development with the municipality. So there's a lot of, uh, pieces at place. So you have to sort of make sure that your municipality or county is aware. We have to make sure that they're making that aware to the to the province. But right now there's, they have a duty to accommodate um, and a duty to consult and accommodate. But that is really only if we on our end from the First Nations perspective push that envelope forward. It doesn't necessarily mean that the county or municipality is going to be like, oh, wait, is this parcel of land under a land claim, do you know? And then they just go on and get their permits, right? And that's typically what has happened. Um, second part of your question. 
let me just refresh because uh, I don't remember myself. I'm looking at other <laughs> questions too while you're answering. But um, are there uh, specific ways that government can make uh, quick, good faith actions? You, you mentioned uh, moratoria, also initial payments or an outside arbitrator to run the land claims process. So we have asked for a neutral arbitrator has not happened uh, to date. Um, and yeah, and I think there was an issue about the trust fund. So no, mm -hmm. <laughs> the trust fund no longer, it got depleted. Um, so they, they, it pretty much built a huge chunk of Canada, upper Canada at the time. Um, so yeah, if there is, there isn't, um, the succession elected council does assign, um, funds to the lands and resources department. Um, but the federal government also realizes that they don't necessarily want to fund a department that's going after the federal government. So it's not adequately funded. Yeah. Um, and they have to, uh, provide own source revenue to help offset those costs. So it's sort of like a lose, lose situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is no trust fund available, but that doesn't mean that one could not be created. That's correct. I mean, so if the if the if the crown saw fit. Um, okay, so a couple other questions. Uh, George Best was wondering how does the doctrine the doctrine of discovery mindset become named as a stumbling block? Uh, is this still operational in the minds of people in the courts and how do we move beyond it? Um, no, I'm, they've, I think they've moved past that now. Um, my conversations, someone asked, I just saw on the thing is who my dad is. Yes, it's Phil Montour. Uh, <laughs> um, many of you may have heard him or spoke to him. He, he's gone to Waterloo several, that area several times. Um, so, uh, it, it, I mean, the, the biggest case for us is, is making sure that the research uh, is done properly. So they've done huge deep dives into, you know, Library and Archives Canada, um, several researchers in the early 1990s, they went to England to go through um, the trustee trust fund records. That's how we got all of those amounts is because they went and they uh, contacted um, the bank at the time. And, but it becomes harder and harder when the government knows like, oh, wait, like they're actually like doing the legwork now to get all these you know, archival documents and, and research done to validate these claims. And there's been, you know, there's been families too, who've also come forward and be like, we know that this piece of land was on the 999 year lease. Like we know that. And some of them, and some of them have said like, when no one in our family wants to live here, we're going to give it back. And there have been parcels that have been added to the reserve as a result as well. Um, because it's not part of, uh, they understand that it was a, is, is a land claim issue. Okay, um, so then I have um, two other questions and Herb, we're, we're still okay for time for two more questions, right? Yeah. I, yeah, I think <laughs> we're doing, I think we're doing questions till 8.30, so. Oh, great, okay. So you've got um, if Janice nine, is up to that. 19, you have, you can split the 19 minutes between these two questions. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, so Melanie Cameron is asking with regard to Caledonia, I'm reading the elected chiefs and you already did, as she was, after she typed this, you did address some of it already, but um, I'm reading that elected chiefs sold the land to developers and that hereditary chiefs were not consulted. I'm also reading that few constituency band members have voted on the matter. Um, can you help us understand those dynamics and what support of the land defenders looks like or not among members of the Six Nations? And just recognizing that you are, you know, you you have to play a role which which goes between all these different factions. Like in any community, no, not everyone agrees with one another. Yeah. So you're kind of in the middle of this. So. Yeah. So in my position, I can only say this: we're very apolitical here at Woodland, but. Um, Understanding the complexities here at Six Nations is, is is tricky even as a as a community member. There's like I said, there there's a lot of having two systems of government and having community members in both who sort of see the pros and cons to both. Keep in mind we're 
one of the largest for, or we are the largest populated First Nation in Canada. So we have, you know, over 26,000 members, roughly 12,000 that live on reserve. Um, you're going to have differing points of view. And also what the media has portrayed and, and what sort of some of the propaganda, I'm going to say, I shouldn't say that, but so some of the stuff that's out there um, is very sort of misguided in some ways. I can't go into the details. I know some of it just because my father does this type of work. So I know some things, but I mean, all I can say is that it there's, at the end of the day, yes, there there is an issue with that parcel of land. Now, whether or not it was done properly or improperly, I can't say. But the complexity of, of being here at Six Nations is also that, you know, you have those who support elected council, you have those who support the traditional Confederacy council, and you have a large portion of the community who don't support either. They're just, we're, we're here, we're, we're doing work that we do in the community but we're not really choosing a political side and that and that is going to be with a lot of communities so it's a tricky situation it's something that you know some of us see some of us don't see some of us understand some of us don't understand and it's a very complex situation that's not really easy to sort of break down in just a few minutes it's something that takes a long time to to understand why these, the, the, why there's this divide in the community. And I sort of speak to it in my, in my presentation, but there was, there was division before there was, you know, I mean, even if you look at how the Haldeman Treaty came to be, it was divisive. It was, you know, not all the six nations agreed that we should be allies of the British. That's why it was only a portion of those who were allies of Joseph Brent who came to what is now the, the Haldeman Treaty uh, lands. There are still many of our, our community who still live um, in the United States because they decided to, to side with the U.S. in the American Revolution. So that's why their the communities are still, that still exist there. So it, it wasn't a simple, it wasn't a simple thing that happened just in 1924 when the elected council was put into power. It's something that has existed for hundreds of years where that break in the Confederacy happened you know, prior to the American Revolution and the tensions, you know, were, it already divided us in a way. And then you, you add on layers and layers of colonization and you add on other, you know, cultural genocide to, to a people, it's, it's going to break us and divide us. And then also sometimes we do unite and we unify on issues, but it's a very, very complex uh, community. It's hard to break that down. I wish I had a more definitive answer, but. Yeah, well, and to me, part of it is I, I'm editorializing a slight bit because I'm the chat moderator, but just to reflect back on that, it, that, you know, there's a, there's definitely uh, a, a big, there's a history of bitter divisions within Mennonite communities across the world. And we're supposed to be the ones that are the peace churches. So, you know, and we don't have those layers that you were talking about to deal with. So. It, I mean, I think it's, it behooves us as Mennonites to say, hey, you know, this isn't, the fact that there's divisions in the community is not an indigenous people thing. It's like a people thing. When you get 12,000 people together, they're not all gonna agree. Um, so then the other question here that I have is Peter asking, um, I've heard some conversation in the past about Six Nations history in the lands currently claimed by Canada before the Haldeman Proclamation but it isn't normally talked about. And I think people of the Six Nations are being, uh, as I think people of the Six Nations is being exclusively living in the current lands claimed by the USA. Can you share anything about that? I think you spoke to that a little bit. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and see where that is because I'm trying to, okay. So yeah, so um, like I, I briefly said before that, you know, prior to the American Revolution, we were all living in upper New York state. So along the Five Finger Lake region, those are considered our traditional homelands. That's, that's where we consider, that's where we came from. Um, that's where we lived. However, 
when the when the Halvin Treaty was developed, and it wasn't like we just picked a random parcel of land out of the blue. Um, this was our traditional beaver hunting grounds. So this is where we would come to, to beaver hunt. Um, so we knew that the land was good. We knew that, you know, it was fertile. We were, we were an agricultural society. Um, you know, we were pretty much sedentary in, in the sense we weren't, we didn't have, we didn't move necessarily for you know the winter season or summer season we you know built these long houses we were would stay there for you know a few decades and then move on to another parcel of land because obviously we knew the land would not cultivate um what we needed anymore and then we would sort of move the villages around and we were very sedentary um people and very agricultural um, but we knew this was our hunting ground. So we knew that when Joseph Brent went to Sir Frederick Haldeman, it wasn't like he just picked a parcel of land out of the blue. He was like, no, I think we, sh we would like to live in this area. We want to live along the Grand River. We wanted to have access to waterways and we still wanted to have access to rich agricultural soil, which we know in this region is quite good for farming. Um, so that's why we chose where we, where we chose. And we knew it was still very heavily forested. It's one of the largest uh, specific species of Carolinian forest. We knew that when we when we chose to move here. So it wasn't like a total accident. Um, it was very specific with why Joseph Brent chose and wrote out, reached out to Sir Frederick Holman about this, about this land treaty. But for those nations that still live in the US, um, they're still part of the Confederacy, but, um, and there's still a lot of relations between community here at Six Nations with many other communities. Uh, for example, my mother is not from Six Nations, she's from Akwazasne, so a Mohawk community near Cornwall, Ontario. Um, but the relationships between our communities are very close. Linguistically, um, I, when I spoke to you guys earlier in Mohawk, that's based on my mother's tongue, she's Mohawk. My father's Mohawk, but he's from Six Nations, but my mother was from Akwazasne. And my paternal grandmother, my dad's mother is from Akwazasne. So we had ties. So like our families are very interrelated and the border doesn't make a difference to, uh, to us as a community. Yeah. Um, Herb had a question that he put in the chat. He said, as advocates and allies, do you have three to five things we should be regularly, regularly advocating for um, beyond those matters that, that, kind of hit the headlines like the Mi'kmaq lobster fishery which are obviously important but there's uh, there's also the stuff that never hits the headlines because it's like quote unquote boring it doesn't it's not sensational but it's ongoing and it's the kind of grinding stuff that you're talking about that just goes on and on mm -hmm. um I think for a lot of people it's you know, the, the stuff that gets sensationalized in the media is the stuff that everyone sort of has as top of mind. Um, so working at Woodland, we sort of talk about all aspects of our culture um, and our history and how it relates to, to today, how it relates to our contemporary society, how it relates to our contemporary living. Um, I think for us, the biggest thing is having people understand our history from our perspective, not what's written in history books, not, not what's written by non-Indigenous authors, but written by our people, told by our people. Um, I also think it's important for people to understand the land claims process because a lot of people don't understand it. They get very scared when they hear land claim. They think we're going to go to swoop in and take your family's, you know, land and property. That's not necessarily what we're looking for that's not what we want yes we want to add to our land base because as the largest first nation in canada we're also running out of we're also running out of land we have a very you know um increase in our population you know the it's it's the fastest growing demographic is among our young people and it, and it keeps doubling every year so you know there's a lack of there's lack of land so people, if you want to live and, and bring up your children in your community, it's very hard. It's not like we can just go out and, you know, move necessarily and not be part of our community. It's like, we're, we're sort of in a way stuck, but I don't think that, I think I'm very happy to live in my community and work in my community. Um, a lot of people don't understand the issues with, you know, housing. And I think I briefly spoke about this with 
Herb and Scott, when we were chatting, like a lot of people don't understand that, you know, when I buy my land and the house that I live in, it's not actually mine. It's the government's because the reserve is considered government property. It's not like, I can't sell my house and my land and, you know, make a profit off of it really at the end of the day. When I, when I signed up for my mortgage, the co I, my co-signer was the band council. And at the end of the day, the federal government. So I can never just be like, Oh, you know, I want to sell my, say I develop financial hardship. I can't sell my land and my house and be like, okay, I can sell that. And then I can, you know, maybe start over or something that, that doesn't happen. It, I can only sell to a community member if that's what's going to happen. And that's hard. And I could never use it as collateral. It's not, it's not an asset that's going to show up in my, on my bank statement. It's not, it's not considered, it's, I'm not, it's not an asset to me. It's, it's not something I can put up as collateral. I'm indebted to the government for my house that I put my own money in, my own working, hardworking money in at the end of the day is not really mine. So there's a lot of things I think a lot of people just don't understand the complexities of the Indian Act, the federal government hold, and why people say, well, why doesn't Six Nations fight for self-government or sovereignty? Yes. But something my dad has always said is, why would we let the gov federal government off the fiduciary responsibility that they have to our people as part of this treaty? Because yes, we can do self-government and, and, and be self-sufficient, but that goes totally completely against our treaty rights. Like, why are we gonna let them off the hook? It's why our, our education system at Six Nations is still heavily a federal school system. It's the employees are employees of, you know, um, Aboriginal uh, Indigenous Affairs Canada. The teachers are, though their community members are federal employees because the schools are federally funded and run and administered. They, we have fought to put cultural into the schools, but that's, it's still at the end of the day, it's federally funded. And the reason we haven't taken over our education system here is because of the cost it would, it would cost us. And at the end of the day, my father has always said to me, why would we let them off their fiduciary responsibility? Yes, it's one thing to say we want to be self-governed. Yes, it's one thing to say we want to be sovereign. We are. In our inherent rights, we are. But at the end of the day, when we do that, it's like we let them off the hook for stuff that they did to our people. Yeah, so every small victory would be like chipping away at the larger victory and the larger responsibility. Yeah. Hmm. All right, um, I have to look at the, I don't think anything else has come in on the chat, um, but those, I think we've, we've given you <laughs> lots of questions. I know there's five minutes left, but um, Unless anybody else has other questions, I'm happy to to uh, give you a break. What do you think, Herb? Will yeah, Scott. We'll we'll take that break right now, uh, and uh, Mim is going to close in prayer. So thank you, Janice. We we are going to continue the conversation. Uh, we're gonna Mim is going to close in prayer right now, uh, and and that will close kind of the official conversation. So thank you all for joining us. And if you wish to leave after Mim's prayer, then by all means, please do. Janice is available to continue the conversation. Uh, but after Mim's prayer, uh, we're going to ask Josie Winterfeld to uh, share about her afternoon. Uh, she and I think it was David Newfolt and Josie will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, went to Caledonia today and has a had a visit there. So Janice, if you want to take a couple minutes to make yourself a cup of tea and uh, relax a little bit, uh, we'll have Mim's prayer. Uh, Josie will share a little bit and then we'll continue the conversation for anybody who wishes to, to join us. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Janice, for, for this conversation. It has been enlightening and, uh, <clears throat> but also kind of in a heavy way. Uh, but thank you for, for sharing us with us uh, this important story. Mim, uh, please, uh, please close in prayer for us. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank Creator for all the words that were spoken tonight. 
I also want to give thanks for the words whose time was not yet to come out um, and for all the thoughts that are going on in your head. Um, I'm sure this will come back to you in the days to come. Um, and we just ask Creator to walk with us and keep us on a good path, find ways of using our voice uh, for the good of all the people that walk on this land, um, but particularly for our Indigenous family and friends um, who this is a daily struggle. Um, it's not an easy way to live. Um, a lot of the time in watching or having people say things to you that are not complimentary or questioning why you don't do something, um, there's not always an easy answer. Um, as Janice has expressed tonight, it's a very complex uh, scenario um, that we need to continue to stand up against. And I, I know Creator will give us that strength and will um, help guide us to find those answers. And I just, I acknowledge each one of you for being here tonight and taking time out of your lives um, to listen and to learn um, because that is really, really important. Um, so I thank Creator for being with you and continuing this journey and giving us all a restful night's sleep. And tomorrow when we get up, it's a new day, it's a new page to write the best story we can for tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And hopefully that will also include ways of finding, a stand, um, to, ways to stand with our, um, not just our Haudenosaunee family, but our, our all our family and friends across the, what we call Turtle Island and to, to advocate um, and make changes. Um, starting with our own hearts. We change our heart and we speak and sit with the person next to us. We can change that heart and together we can change a county, a city, a, a country, and a world. Nyo, miigwech, and creator be with you all. Amen. Thank you, Mim. So yes, thank you for joining us. Our, our next presentation is gonna be in about a month's time. You're certainly welcome to, to join us again. We look forward to that. Uh, Scott, Josie, do we, anybody you know, remember off the top of their head who's speaking next month? Is that gonna be Steve and, uh, uh, and uh, Rick? I think it's Lindsay. Lindsay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lindsay is uh, in November. Lindsay um, Mullins Kuna uh, from uh, works with MCC Timmins, and then the following on we'll take a break in December, and then in January we have um, Steve Heinrichs and Rick Koberbaumann speaking. And so in the middle we've got the Mennonite folks speaking about our connections with Indigenous folks, and then at the end we have a couple other Indigenous voices sharing. Excellent. So yes. Please join us again in a month's time. Josie, do you want to share a bit about your afternoon? Um, yeah, I wasn't actually planning on making a presentation, but just to say- I put you on the spot, yes. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, that um, a couple of us went on behalf of the MCEC Truth and Reconciliation um, Truth and Reconciliation Working Group to uh, visit at the 14, the Haudenosaunee Land Defenders at the 1492 Land Back site. Um, we ended up not being able to get onto the site. There was a lot going on today. So instead, um, we spent some time at uh, the courthouse because uh, there were nine people um, that had been arrested uh, and so we were just being a presence there. And then we went to a site very close to the 1492 site uh, that did not have an injunction on the land, but there were, there's a, a Six Nations presence there. And so we got to uh, sit around the fire with a couple of people and have 
conversation and that was just um uh that was such a blessing to be able to do um and i would just say in in echo to what jenna said that we have we understand that there are a lot of complexities and that there are a lot of um it, within the community and understandings about uh uh those actions. And for us going to visit, it's not about taking sides. It is about us saying that we cannot criminalize people defending their land. And, uh, and, and uh, as, as Canadians, that's really important for us to, um, to support uh, Six Nations, as well as all under other Indigenous peoples, have a right to defend their land without being criminalized, and that was the important thing for us to 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 be able to say in in going there. Um, yeah, and so it it was uh, good to be a small part of that today. Thank you, Josie, for the update and. Even more so, thanks for representing. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Yeah, I think we'll continue to use this, the chat feature, Scott, if that's okay. Uh, so if anybody has another question, if you can fire it off to Scott. Has your has your dad uh, published any books? I know I'm not using the Scott the, the Scott feature, the chat feature. My apologies. <laughs> uh, yeah, has has your dad published any books? Uh, no, not not formally. Um, other besides working on the Global Solutions uh, document and uh, the other documents you'll find on SixNations.ca. Majority of it was from his research and work that he's been doing. Um, no, he has not uh, published. I've been trying to convince him for quite some time to um, capture a lot of what his knowledge is. Um, he's, you know, he's getting older now. Um, so I try to spend as much time learning from him and speaking with him and trying to um, capture a lot of what he's learned over the years. So that's, um, that's definitely something I wanted to um, do with him down the road. Um, and during quarantine, I thought I was gonna have a chance to sort of have him sit down with me. And, um, we actually have, I have this idea to do a podcast with him. Um, cause he doesn't like being on camera. So I said, well, what about doing a podcast? Wouldn't that be like sort of fun? And I actually have like episodes, uh, laid out sort of drafts about what to do. And, uh, yeah. So he had a very verbal, um, altercation with a previous city of Brantford mayor. And so I was going to sort of name it off of, of that a little bit and make it very cheeky, but he wasn't too, too fan of the title. So, um, we'll see where it goes, but yeah, um, hopefully fair. you can't not tell us what that cheeky title is. <laughs> it's, it's not a nice word. <laughs> if anyone knows, uh, the altercation between my dad and the Brantford city mayor, it was, uh, Fair enough. Not a nice word <laughs> in between the two of them. <laughs> There's more or less, like, I was going to call it like the life and times of a land claims researcher. So, okay. but the original uh, title is very cheeky. <laughs> I, I did MCC, find... Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say the MCEC um, Zoom would, would censor it out anyway. It has <laughs> Um, Steve does have a question. Uh, you were going to say something, no, Herb? Nothing relevant. Okay. Um, Steve, I missed his question earlier, and it is, have any community groups like faith groups done any creative engagements around land that you'd encourage us as churches to consider or reflect on? And obviously, and Steve goes on to say that he thinks churches need to be actively supporting land defenders. Um not not that i'm aware of um that have been set up um or sort of those committees i think anytime we have people who want to spread the word about what what is happening or what we're doing or how to 
you know, tell, you know, your municipal, county, provincial, federal, um, where you live is, is always something important. And I think too, um, reaching out to the first nations, see how can we help? It's very, it's hard for me to sort of say that because I don't work in that sort of sector per se. Um, but at Woodland, you know, we work obviously, uh, we worked very closely with uh, Mennonites um, for the residential school restoration project. And that's sort of how the relationship sort of came to be. So building relationships is really key. How do you, um, and I, I talk about building meaningful relationships, being, building meaningful partnerships. So that's not just a one-sided thing. So, you know, when the Mennonite group came to us, and I think I was actually part of the first initial conversations with this many, many years ago, um, was like, well, how can we help? You know, we not necessarily uh, have, we might not necessarily have a financial contribution, but we could do this, this, or this. And I remember being like, well, yeah, that, that totally works. Like we, you know, we need hands on the, you know, hands and feet on the ground and, you know, we, what, what else can we do? Like, so there's always creative solutions to that. And I think that's sort of why, you know, when the request came forward for me to speak tonight and I thought, well, this was a very reciprocal reaction to that relationship that was being built between Woodland and, and, and Mennonite um, Truth and Reconciliation Committee and, and, the group that gave their time, literally sweat and tears to help with that piece. So understanding about building these um, relationships with the communities um, is really, really key. But also understanding that you don't want to go in saying, well, this is what we should do, or this is, you know, is trying to understand, well, what, what do we need? What do they need? How can we be a, a meaningful partner? In, in it but it's, it's not an easy answer I, I don't have an easy answer for that other than that it takes time to build those relationships uh but reaching out to you know most first nations communities will have a land claim specialist or researcher just fyi because the federal government does put aside some funds not a lot regarding land claims resource and and, and resources i should also explain that um the lands and resources office at six nations doesn't just particularly look at the land claim piece they also look at our resource rights so hunting and fishing um, as well which is obviously also impacts uh, many first nations today so reaching out to those uh, departments or people um, working in those communities is always key um, another question came in, and just before I get to that question, I just wanted to shout out to Josie, who is um, who is on the call, and she was part of um, helping get the ball rolling for that that uh, visit to help with the restoration as well. I went along for the ride and put in a bit of sweat myself, and it was great. Um, it was a wonderful experience, and I think it was a really good way to instead of just going and saying, "Well, we're we're asking you to do this," but I think one thing that often get, happens is. We just will, as people, as people of privilege, will ask um, Indigenous people, for example, please tell, please help us learn. And, and um, it can't be one sided like that, that we're always saying, please teach us, because that takes energy as well. So it yeah. felt good to go down and actually do something like spend a week down there and just get some work done ourselves that we were asked to do that was definitely, we didn't just say, well, um, let's let's find some place to start start doing construction or whatever. It was like, mm -hmm. here's something specific that Six Nations want us to do. Anyway, um, that was a great experience. And uh, Beth Metzger has a question about: um, Can you more specifically define what it means to defend your land? I see the possibility of some people balking at support at supporting this phrase due to their stance on pacifism, as they might be afraid of encouraging violence. I'm guessing a definition could help us allay some of those fears. And I think that's a really interesting question. Ooh. Not how an do easy I, one. I was gonna say, how do I respond to that question? Um, so I think my parents had a little bit of activism in them back in the early 70s, um, late 60s, early 70s. It didn't really pass on to me per se. Um, but I think the best way, like, 
unfortunately, like, I can like, okay, I can only speak for this from my own personal perspective because I can't, I don't want to speak for everyone or, and because it's not, it's not that easy. Um, for me, I specifically cannot physically go down there and stand on the front lines for a number of reasons. A lot of it has to do with my job. I have to be able to work with two very distinct systems of government in my community, for one. From a labor issue and, and my employment issue, I can never get a record uh, due to the position I hold at Woodland. So as an executive director, I cannot have any criminal record whatsoever. So I probably will never be on the front lines while I'm doing this type of work um, in my community. I just, I, I, I can't technically do it from that sort of sense. Um, but how do I defend my land and my, people's inherent rights to our land is through exactly what I'm doing here tonight, through education, through making people aware of what the, you know, origins are for our people. And when it comes to land claims, what does it mean? What does treaty rights mean? What is, you know, resource rights mean to our people? Um, that's how I defend the land. That's, it's also why, you know, I make sure I, I understand the history is why I make sure I understand the research, which is why I have to spend time with my father to do more because this isn't my specialty. I'm more specialized in arts and culture. So a little different from my dad. Um, but I specifically have to know the history and the context of which that gets taken from because it really has defined of how we've come to a place where we are today and to have that understanding. So for me, how I defend the land is by sharing our truth, by sharing our history as, as told to me by my people, as we're a very oral um, people when it comes to our history and there are, in our language, there, there's transcripts that, you know, talk about certain parcels of land specifically because they remember and it was been told to them because, you know, maybe their great, great grandfather was a hereditary chief at the time. And so they knew certain things. They, they know why there are certain records that don't exist or why those laces were given to that family on that parcel of land. So how I defend the land is by doing exactly what I do. Um, I think for others, it's their own way of doing it, whether that's physically being at the front lines, physically taking a stand. Um, and that's what that's, you know, obviously their, their decisions, but, you know, I've never asked my dad this, if he's ever gone to any of the blockades, to be honest, I've never asked him. Um, it just occurred to me, I don't, I couldn't even, I don't even know if he's ever been, but he does he does the research. He does, this is what he does. This is his, what he will say, his frustrating passion. Can I just add to what Jana said about, um, I think sometimes Mennonites use that as a little bit of an excuse to not go and stand with people because they're afraid of the violence. Going and standing and showing your support by being there is not a violent way of doing things. What happens at those events is not necessarily within your control. Um, and if violence happens and you're there, then that's the way it is. Like that's, that's beyond your control. But by going and standing with these people and letting your presence be known about how you feel about the situation um, sends a really strong message to the people that are on the front lines that there are non-Indigenous people who do support them, um, who believe in what they're saying, um, and are willing to stick their necks out, like literally stick their necks out and stand with them and say, we don't think this is right either. You're not the only ones. You're not in this. Um, on your own. There are people that do stand with you. Um, and to me, that is like phenomenally huge for people to do that. Um, I'm removed from um, the land, what the Six Nations is going through right now, but I also very much understand it um, because I have a lot of 
friends that are 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 standing on the front lines and saying but this is my land like we have an agreement what is your problem and why don't people understand this um, and why aren't they here standing with us um, and so just going and being there if you need to leave because things get violent that's up to you but just showing your support and being present like Josie and the group did today like even if you can't get close listen to the stories listen to why these people are there understand listening is huge um and that's one reason in my closing that i i said you know like listen with your heart um that's the most important thing you can do is to listen and to learn and then stand up and that is that is not a violent solution I just add one quick thing to that, to every, all the wonderful things that have been said that I think it's really important as, as settlers and as Mennonites to acknowledge, you know, that the violence is being perpetrated by the police forces that we are paying for with our tax dollars. And if we don't speak up against that, I mean, what, how can we call ourselves Mennonite, if, if you know, to put it bluntly. So I think that I, I understand the question and I, and I know Beth and I, she, I, I hear what she's saying on the, on the chat. And I think it's important to recognize who's doing the violence, um, you know, and those 200 um, settlers that, that um, ended up at the, the fish plant and that burned it to the ground. And, you know, that's, you know, as fellow settlers, we have to say that you, this, we can't have this colonial violence being perpetrated in our names with our, you know, using our money. Anyway, I could go on, but I will stop. Can I blurt out a question? Janice, do you have room for one more question? Sure. What can we do to educate ourselves? Do you have any books you recommend or anything you suggest you, you've You've uh, already suggested, and, and last month as well, we heard the suggestion, you know, build relationships, have ongoing, sustaining relationships. But yeah, what else can we do to educate ourselves? Books, podcasts. Um, yeah, I think really, honestly, just, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is asking those very simple questions. Why, what, how, when, where, like, Finding those out, those very simple questions about why why is it why is this exist why does this happen why you know how come it hasn't been resolved um, but asking you know reaching out to communities but there's also you know there's a lot of resources you know within um, the urban centers as well that you can reach out to there's a lot of you know um, they have resources available through you know the friendship centers. Um, a lot of the most university and college programs has an indigenous, you know, uh, indigenous component to them, um, where they do outreach into their own communities outside of the out of this university or college uh, facilities. And then, like I said, uh, you know, there there's probably a bit more happening now and, and reaching a, a little bit of a larger audience because we're sort of in this virtual mode. Um, like I wouldn't normally get to speak if I have to go in person to speak, I'm speaking to a very small amount of people, but through this, you know, I was able to, you know, really get into um, speak with people from across, you know, all, all over to, to speak about this. Um, yeah. Like when I, when I'm, even when I'm, asking myself my own like my own questions about why things happen why you know I read I, I go to those who and I, I get different points of view obviously because it's it's really hard to sort of develop in a concise matter um because it's such a long period of history um so you know I do a lot of work in my community I do a lot of work you know I volunteer in a lot, a lot of sectors um but really just looking out to those communities that are, that are near you, look at, look at who's, you know, find out first, like, okay, well, where am I? Like, who's traditional territory is this? That's a very simple starting point. And then from there, you can start doing some more of your own research and, and reading about that, that uh, First Nation or Indigenous group that your the traditional territory is, 
it, that's who who's it belongs to or when i say belong it's a weird word because we don't really necessarily see that as a as a thing we're here to sort of take care and and do that for our, for our mother earth but i think and I, I think that's, and that's the other piece that a lot of people don't quite understand. It's not necessarily about necessarily a sense of ownership, although that's kind of how we relate it to uh, sometimes to non-Indigenous people, because that's sort of a, a concept they can understand. But like, we're here to caretake for everyone. It's not just as far, it's not just for our people, you know, it, it's for the whole, the whole good you know it's not it's not just you know yes we want to take care of our community our families and community you know because that's who we see that's who we interact with every day but you know when I'm thinking about the impacts that we have on the Grand River itself specifically I'm thinking about generations down the road I'm also thinking about our neighbors I'm thinking about what we do how does that impact the people who are next to me how does that impact the people north of me um and it's not necessarily about the, the community itself all the time it's about well what are we doing to this land that we're we're sort of supposed to be taking care of and I think that's why even when we have entered into partnerships it has been around things around renewable energy because we don't want to enter into something that is going to deteriorate the land in which we were supposed to be taken care of that's why you know, when people ask us about partnerships, we're very specific. We're very, you know, we're, we don't want it to be one-sided, but we also don't want it to be detrimental to the future of generations um, and those faces yet to come that we don't want to leave them in a bad place. And, you know, I think if anything, we've learned a lot in the last decade that we are not doing a very good job of that as a whole human race, not just indigenous people. I don't know if I really answered that question. <laughs> oh, no, that helped a lot. That helped out. In fact, it, it reminded me that uh, here in the Niagara area, and I don't know how many of us from Niagara are, are still in the chat, but almost every library, uh, public library, has a separate bookshelf stocked with uh, Indigenous books, both fiction and nonfiction, uh, that uh, a, a local group has put together. And that's a great resource that we have as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Janice. Scott, do you have any other questions coming in? I don't think so. There's been, um, yeah, there's been there's been a number of people just um, chiming in and saying, uh, yeah, there. Are, there's no, I don't see any question marks in what they're saying, so I'm going to say there's no questions. <laughs> I'm seeing quite a few thank yous to Janice in the chat here and comments. So thank you so much, Janice. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I guess we're almost there. Maybe we'll, we'll leave it open for a little bit longer, Janice, so that you can read those comments in the chat. I think they all disappear as soon as we, we shut everything down. Uh, so we'll let you read those if that's all right. And uh, Blessings to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Grace and peace to you from uh, our creator God who made us all and has called us all to himself and who has given us the, the ministry of reconciliation. Grace and peace and we look forward to seeing you in a month.